stream. Thank you all for attending. Welcome to Tea at Taxevity. Our topic today is about stress and also about midlife crises. So that's something that is relevant to some of us, this, or maybe most of us. I'm your host, Pramod Sharma. I'm the actuary at Tax Avity Insurance. And when we're not doing interviews, I help people transfer financial risks with life and health insurance. We have a special guest. Who are you and what do you do when you're not being interviewed? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, a lot of things. Oh, hi, my name is Kira Leskew. I'm the founder of the Eagle Institute, and we help people with a few different things. First of all, we help them to mitigate the effects of stress, which helps business performance, but also just honestly helps people feel better. Um, in doing that, we've come a lot across a lot of people that are going through a midlife crisis, which can look like stress um, when it's beginning and um, is actually something different and requires different skills to get through it. So uh, we help people to get through that stuff so that they can get to the other side. You don't have to tolerate feeling bad. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. And those of you watching live, you can type your questions and we will have time for our uh, Q&A section also. So you will definitely be able to participate. To get started, uh, how would you describe stress? Well, first of all, I, and I've seen a lot of this, people think there's good stress and there's bad stress. If you talk oh, that's to- That's one of my questions, but okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, well, okay, well, high performers, um, if you ask them on a scale of one to 10, like 10 being I feel stress all, time, all the time, like every day, and one feel, meaning I never feel stress, what do you think high performers would score on that? Hmm. Um. I would say probably a seven or eight. Yeah, one. One? Yeah, they feel almost no stress. Oh. Yeah. Because isn't they're high performers? Isn't that interesting? It's shocking to people. I expected it to be low, but I didn't expect it to be that low. And the reason being is there's a difference between stimulation and stress. Like stimulation means you're in the moment. Things might be from the outside looking in, stressful so we look at someone that's doing something that we perceive would be stressful so we think it's stressful or if we were to do the same thing we think it's stressful but for those high performers it's not they're having a good time and they're using a different part to their brain as a result now when i ask the average person you know especially people that are executives or entrepreneurs how much stress they're experiencing i rarely get answers lower than uh, seven unless someone's just been on vacation or they've just like de delegated their whole business and they're just sort of you know um, keeping track of it and not really working in it so okay now I don't know if I should say I'm more of a two or more of a seven now that I know <laughs> <laughs> how this skill works but stress seems to be something that's part of normal life isn't it you know what we've kind of been sold that it is and it's really unfortunate because when you look at how people perform and how long it takes to do things and the physical effects like there we're at an all-time high for chronic illness in our society and if business isn't careful they're going to be severely impacted like according to stats cans numbers we have more than half of the workforce is missing work every year due to chronic illness that's either 100% caused by or significantly um, contributed to by stress. And those numbers are projected to grow to 70%. Now, how do you wanna be a manager of a people where 70% of your people can't function properly because of health issues that are preventable because of stress? Mm -hmm. Like think that's of your own self, like how well do you work when you're sick? And we kind of get used to this level of just going through the motions on things because we're stressed. We don't even realize we're stuck in first gear and we have all these other gears that we can access, but we're not used to being there. And we've let ourselves get, and we forget what that's like. And honestly, some people have never known because a lot of people are stressed from the time they're children and they never even know that these that what's possible in terms of not only well-being but a performance yeah, so when i have a flu i know i can't do much basically yeah. it's lying around and not doing anything but with stress but then like i know i have a flu i know i don't have a flu yeah. and most of the time i don't have one but yeah. with stress it's not really like that it's not that you f it just seems to be something that's there the whole time is it not 
No, that's the thing. It can go away. So when I ask people, um, you know, especially people that are in leadership roles, you know, tell me the last time you had a breakthrough idea. And then I ask them, what was your stress level? Very, like very, very rarely it's anything above a two or three. And they have these, these moments of clarity and this, these moments of insight or new products are born or new divisions are born or new businesses are born when they're cutting the grass, when their phone's broken and they're sitting in the airport, when they're having a shower, when they're on their exercise break. But why would you wait until like life kind of delivers you a moment like that by, by chance almost? Why not live there? And that's what high performers do. They're in that state almost all the time. And that's why they're outperforming everyone because they're having those kind of ideas all the time. And they're managing themselves so that they can execute on them. Okay, that's interesting. So how does stress affect people's abilities? Well, it, interestingly enough, it does a number of things, and none of them are really good. <laughs> none of them are so good, okay. The physical response to stress, it's intended to deal with something that's physical in nature. So if you're walking, um, you know, downtown busy street and you walk out into traffic and all of a sudden a car comes around the corner the stress response kicks in so you make an instant decision do i jump out of the way do i run across the road or mm -hmm. if you know heaven forbid someone attacked you or something like that you you would also have a third response and that's to kind of play dead and pretend nothing so and that's called fight or flight we right. need to prepare to fight, but it's a physical response. And then when we have that physical response, it takes care of the stress hormones in our body for us. Um, but it keeps us on high alert until we calm down and the nervous system calms down. When our stresses are mental or emotional in nature, we never get that release. So they just continue to go. So what happens is we lose the first thing we lose is our ability to perform skills well that we would normally do otherwise. The other thing that goes is creative thinking. This is what happens is the brain narrows and focuses and it's looking for the, the next threat. So say you're in a business meeting and someone does something and it really gets you angry and gets your back up and you, you start to trigger a little bit of the stress and the fight or flight goes off. You start looking at everybody else in the meeting and, and perceiving everything as a threat whether it is or not. Mm -hmm. And your, you know, your colleague or maybe someone who's working on your behalf on the other party, you don't hear what they're actually saying. You're running it through this lens of this is a threat. So you're not actually hearing accurately what's being said. On top of that, you add a whole bunch of physical responses that really contribute to ill health when you've had them over a long period of time. So the skills we lose the most are logical thinking. Um, creative thinking, problem solving, our ability to connect with other people, our ability to interpret behavior properly, and um, our ability to think outside of the box, which is to find new solutions. Now, how many of those do people not need today in the workplace? Yeah, that's a really good point. I've heard that there are two kinds of stress, and maybe you can clarify this. Yep. I've heard that there's good stress and bad stress. So the bad stress is called distress, and the yep. good stress is called eustress, which I think is EU stress. Like, is that how stress is defined, that there are good and you bad? Well, I've heard that that's classically defined, but when I look at the, the research around it, there's stimulation and there's stress. So stimulation, you know, if you are, you know, an, air, an airline pilot and you're dealing with a lot of stress but you love flying, you get into this zone where you're accessing the creative parts of your brain even though um, it's something that's really challenging to do. And elite athletes do this, other elite performers do that, even like people like tax accountants or <laughs> computer programmers. Actuaries maybe. <laughs> yeah, when they're, when they're in it and solving the problems, it's not stressful because they're enjoying what they're doing, they're focused on the task, and it might be a problem. So if that's what they mean by you stress, then I would say yes. But when you're in stress, and it's real stress, even low amounts, we start to lose skills. And they've done studies with surgeons and engineers and all kinds of people that are uh, airline pilots that are really skilled at their jobs. And when they submit them to stress, even mild amounts, they make mistakes that they, they just don't otherwise. Okay, so. that makes sense. Now, you 
also wanted to talk about a midlife crisis. So first yeah. of all, what is a midlife crisis? Yeah. And yeah. how is that different from stress? Yes, so a midlife crisis occurs as a natural point of growth when you've kind of outgrown your life. Now, for a lot of people or certain segments of your life, and that happens as a point where sort of our life is calling us to grow and move forward. And if you don't go through that, then you start to experience symptoms that can look like stress. Usually it's dissatisfaction, it's um, unhappiness, it's maybe even feeling a little overwhelmed, but you just don't get the, the, the satisfaction and the joy that you would normally have otherwise out of things that in the past may have really done that for you. The reason for that is, is that we are being called to go into our blind spots because that's where we can really grow. And most people avoid doing that because it's honestly, right. it's, not an, <laughs> it's not an easy thing to do. And so we try and do things that we've done in the past, like, oh, you know, and we try and solve it as if it's a stress problem or just any other problem in our life. So. Um, I'm not, I'll change this relationship, I'll start a new project, I'll get in shape, or, you know, these all might be great things to do, and a lot of times it's do dramatic things, like, you know, get rid of my business partner, or, you know, break up a personal relationship that's significant, and then you go through all this, and, and it's still there. So that's what's different with a midlife crisis, and how, the, why they can look similar. Okay, interesting. Now, are you going to give us any help on how to deal with stress and midlife crises? <laughs> yeah, so with stress, one of the best things, and people um, often don't like to hear this, but meditation is the fastest thing, learning meditation skills to deal with stress. And there have been a number of, um, even in people that have dealt with, you know, some trauma, like, you know, police officers and people that are being constantly exposed to major amounts of stress it's been proven to work the reason why is that you need to calm the nervous system down so it gets out of that cycle now interestingly enough for midlife crisis what you need to do is learn to go inside and stop looking outside of yourself for answers and for things and look with inside yourself and say what are the blind spots that I'm missing and when I work on those blind spots those the happiness and the joy starts to come back the answer is kind of the same. You need to do some kind of meditative or even just reflective type techniques where you're getting to know yourself better and understanding who you are now and who you become, which you can kind of just get in a habit and a rut in your life where you're not, you know, you've changed and you have your life doesn't reflect that. So mm -hmm. now are there easy ways to do meditation? Yes. Okay. So there, there are hard ways. <laughs> yeah, let's talk um, about I, I an easy way. Stuff, um, and I've seen things where they're asking beginners to, to do things. I'm like, wow, like this is really hard. So one of the biggest misconceptions that people have with meditation, and I think why, the, why they're reluctant to try it, is they think it's like just sitting and having no thoughts. And that's an outcome of someone who's had a lot of advanced practice, or honestly, there's just some people that are naturally talented. I was not one of those people. <laughs> I'm not so, either. <laughs> so the it's like anything else in life. You just you need to take baby steps into it. So what you do is you try to limit the amount of stimulation, but you give your mind a little job to do. So it can be something like one thing people like doing is counting breaths. Another thing you can do is like one of the ones that I love doing with beginners are either sight or sound meditations. So a sound meditation, you can be sitting in a room and you just listen to all the things that are going on around you. And if you start thinking a thought, you're like, oh, I wonder if I sent, oh, wait, no, I'm listening to the sounds. <laughs> okay. and, then, and then you bring your focus back to the sounds. Now this does a few things. First of all, it calms the nervous system down, but it also improves our focus, which means that when you go to actually do work, you get it done way faster and way less time. Okay, so for meditation, if someone is starting off, how long do they need to meditate? Is it like 10 minutes? Is it half an hour? Honestly, it depends on the style, the type of meditation you're doing. So if you're doing, it, like, and, and also anything helps. If you start okay. off with one or two minutes, 
um, it's probably not going to have a big effect, but it's better than doing nothing. So it's kind of like, how much exercise do you need? Well, you need enough to get fit. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But where are you starting from? So if you're starting from laying in bed, if you get up and walk to the end of your driveway and back, that might be a significant amount. And the same is true with meditation. If you're really in a lot, a lot of distress, where you're really completely stressed out, like maybe just like doing a meditation walk where you just go outside and look, like count how many flowers you can see in the summer. Um, that may be a really good place to start. Someone who's kind of in a normal zone, that you probably want to start with at least 30 minutes if you're doing like a, just a standard meditation. If you're doing something that's breath techniques, that takes less time, but you do need to work with a teacher on those. So Okay, if you are doing the 30 minutes, is that 30 yeah. minutes all at one time yeah. or can it be all, all yeah. at once? And is the optimal time in the morning before work or any time during the day? The optimal time is when you can do it consistently. Okay, so so that could be, for some people that might be at lunchtime, for example, or yeah. after work, after the kids are in bed or whatever. Yeah, when, when you find that you know you can do it regularly, one people thing that I know people that do it at lunchtime find they usually eat less. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because so the, we're often, when we go into stress mode, our body will send a signal that it needs more energy. So if you calm that signal down, you know, you will naturally choose things that are a little bit less fat dense in most cases. So if you can get yourself into a good feeling place first, and you'll usually feel fuller and satisfied faster. Okay, that's interesting. So there are side benefits from yeah, the, the meditation. So <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, I guess that's the, the point of, of doing the meditation. <laughs> yeah. I just want to share another thing that really illustrates like why this is so beneficial. So sure. I had a client that called me up at the end of a day and they were doing a big presentation the next morning. They had people flying in from across North America and it, this was their client and they they called her up at the end of the day around four o'clock and said, we need to change the whole thing for tomorrow because we've had a number of internal problems. And this was a four hour thing. And she's like, it's four in the afternoon. And she told me it was like right. after four. And she's like, she's freaking out. And she's like, hi, how can I, give me something that I can, you know, calm down so that I can focus. And I'm like, um, you know, honestly, you really want this? And she said, yes. And I said, go for, uh, go and meditate. It was beautiful. Go outside and do a walking meditation for 45 minutes before you start on anything. And she's like freaking out at me like, I have six hours of work to do. I'm going to be up past midnight. And I'm right. like, well, do you want to bring your best to it? Or do you want to bring who you are right now who's really upset and stressed? So she did. And she called me back an hour later. And she said, so that, and she said I'm done. I said, oh, you're done your meditation? She said, no, I'm done my presentation for tomorrow. Oh. I said, okay, did you go for them? Yeah, she said, yes. And she said, I was just about to walk back into my office and I realized that I thought, you know, at least I didn't think of any great ideas, but at least I feel calm. And then she said right after that, she remembered a project that she'd worked on three years ago. She pulled it out and it was cut and paste for what she needed for the next morning. And she would never have remembered that if she hadn't calmed down first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny that the time we need to take a break, we don't think we have the time. But if we do take that break, meditate, whatever, then we end up saving time overall. It's really strange. Yeah, and the majority of people that do this beyond, you know, just a few months find that usually they save at least 50% of their time at work because they're, they're recognizing when they're wasting time. They think of better ways to do things. They focus faster. So it's not wasting time. You can think of it like what, what makes more sense if your car's out of gas? Walking to your next appointment or going <laughs> and putting gas? No, seriously, like it's obvious yeah. when you say that. But when it comes to ourselves and our, how our brain works, we don't think of it the same way. Right, that's true. Now, Jeevan, you've been monitoring the, the live stream for questions. Uh, can you ask us a question from the stream? Sure. So one question is, uh, how have stress and uh, crisis management techniques impacted your life personally, Kira? Yeah. 
Well, um, honestly, I had a pretty, the reason why I can do this is I started out um, in a pretty stressful industry. I was in automotive and appliance trim and, um, you know, people were pretty sick in that industry. So I just didn't go down that path. But other than that, um, you know, when I started my next business, I just didn't let myself go there. So our, our business had tremendous growth. We were, um, you know, we didn't apply for the Profit 100, but had we have, we would have qualified in manufacturing in the middle of a depression, like, you know, in the, the financial crises. And we just were able, able to find solutions easily um, to, for all the problems that came up. And I didn't work a lot. You know, I only worked like 25, 30 hours a week. And we had tremendous business growth and high quality and a lot of innovation. And it's because we made that a principle of our company. Excellent. Okay, thank you. And another question is, uh, should uh, children be taught these kinds of methods from a young age? They, they, there are techniques that are appropriate for children to do. Doing full meditation, no. And the reason why is that they have a different um, amount of brain waves than adults do. And children are already open to um, really rapid learning. And if they do, they should, they should be taught calming techniques and relaxation techniques, but deep meditation, it, it makes them too um, vulnerable to um, boundaries around them. So they should learn to create calm. They should learn like emotional awareness. Like I feel angry right now. Okay. So how do I calm down if I feel angry? Um, acknowledge their feelings, but doing like prolonged meditation. No, not, not until they're older. Okay. Excellent. And uh, the final one we have is uh, how do you feel about social media and stress in today's society? Uh -huh. That's well, a good you know, one. It, yeah, that's a good one because here we are on social media right now. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, so it is again, the more that you meditate, the more that you can control your response to that. There's been a lot of science that shows that our exposure to technology, whether it's social media or other things, can create the, the opposite of what we're trying to create, which is connection. And um, we do need time out from this. There's a lot of science showing that negative impact that technology has on our brain waves and our mental and emotional health. So I think like with anything else in life, you know, use it wisely, use it as a tool, you know, when you're supposed to, but overexposure um, without doing techniques to counteract that activates a lot of parts of the brain that, um, you know, are depression, anxiety, and stress. So, you know, do your meditation. <laughs> or no, but also take time out. Like take time out every day where there's nothing that's grabbing your attention. Great. That's an excellent response. And our final question is, do you find that using these techniques can help people get away from coping mechanisms, say, you know, eating or uh, perhaps the use of alcohol? Absol absolutely. So I'm just going to share my, my, um, my own story on that. So um, I used to, um, I wouldn't say drink a lot, but it was like certainly a social thing. Like, uh, you know, I come from a cultural background in my family where alcohol is like a normal part of me every meal almost. And um, then, you know, I started doing yoga and meditating. And then one day I had a you know, I was just sitting at dinner and I just looked at it and I'm like, I just don't want you. Like I didn't try to quit. I didn't do anything. It's just that I'd done enough of calming myself down that to take alcohol would mean that I would feel worse and not better. And I felt so good that I didn't want it. Excellent. Well, perfect. Thank you very much for your answers, Kira. You're welcome. Okay. So as we wrap up, Kira, what's your key message for the people watching live or afterwards in the replay? Yeah, I think the key thing is, is first of all, stress is a sign that things are out of control and they're off track. And if you're experiencing stress, you need to do something about it. 
because the way our the mechanisms of our body, mind, and emotions work, there it's not going to happen, or you can't afford to wait until it happens. You can perform so much better, and you can have all the good stuff now if you just learn some skills, and that's all it is is skills. If you find that you're in that midlife crisis, um, there that's something that's not going to go away. It's a do it now or do it later. And when there's tremendous gifts in getting to the other side in terms of personal growth. So if you think that you might be going through a midlife crisis, you know, there's not a lot of resources out there, honestly. When I, when I went through it, um, I, didn't, I found it really difficult to get help, which is why I've created a number of tools to help people through it. So you don't have to suffer through it. Neither one of these, like suffering through it, should be a sign that you need to stop and do something about it. And if people will just do that and not accept it, then they can start to get answers and, and get, to re get to results. What's the best way for people to reach you? Yeah, so um, if people are on social media, um, they can connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook. If they want to reach out to me personally, or if they want just to learn more resources about stress in particular, go on theeagleinstitute.com. Um, we have a little quiz there that people can take to see, um, you know, how severe it really is. And if they really want to talk about midlife crisis, like reach out to me personally. They can use my personal email, kira at kiralescu.com. Um, and, you know, I'd be happy just to help them assess whether or not this is something they're experiencing. That's terrific. Thank you so much for being a guest, Kira. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here and um, it was awesome. Okay, thanks to everyone for watching. That's the end of our live stream.